let's bow our head for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this evening. Thank you, Holy Father, for gathering all your dear children from far and near today. You gathered us yesterday. One more time we are gathered in your presence to hear what the Spirit of God will speak to the churches and specifically to the nation of the United States. For such a time as this, we have gathered us here that we may hear your heart, not the opinion of a man, but your word, your thoughts, your heart, that we may know what we should do, rightfully do. Thank you, Father. Now we ask you, Spirit of the living God, to open each and every one of your dear sons and daughters' hearts, even to those who are afar off, watching through online. I pray the very presence that is present here will also be present in their various homes. Thank you, Father. I lift up my hands unto you. And I swear by him who dwells in unapproachable light and upon him who sits on the throne, the Lamb of God, and upon the seven spirits of God, that your will be done today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. amen. And all who said amen, please be seated. Now, it has been my custom for the last few years <coughs> uh, to specially wait on the Lord during the seasons of uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. <coughs> Excuse me. For many years, some of my um, prophetic friends, American pro prophetic friends, ministers of God, they used to sh share with me how the Lord used to visit them during uh, these special days. Although I respected um, their particular um, belief and their particular um, way of looking at things, to me, to me it was, why observe this Jewish festival? Okay, to me. But of course, I just kept it inside me. I never voice it out. Because I respect what each individual uh, believes. Especially our wonderful brother Bobby Connor and Paul Keith Davies, they used to share with me, you know, or they used to have powerful visitation during those two special days. But I always used to just brush it off. Okay, that's Jewish festival. If they like to observe, that's fine with them. Why, why do we need to observe Jewish festival? Okay. Then in 2010, I was uh, invited to minister at a conference in London. And um, the pastor, a very nice, godly Indian man from Sri Lanka, he was the one who invited me. He organized the meeting. So he picked me from the airport was driving a long distance to the airport, uh, to the hotel. On the way, he just started talking. One subject led to another subject, to another subject, and he came to talk about the Jewish face. So the moment I heard Jewish face, I just switch off. Okay, he's a pastor, no? He's my host. So you should not offend the host. 
not everybody is so sweet, you know. <laughs> right? So you don't want to offend the host, just sleep it up. And I always like to close my eyes and sleep in the car. And if you're sitting in the back, nobody watches you. Whether you're paying attention or you're sleeping. Just every now and then say, Amen. <laughs> amen. Yes, Amen. But this time, I was listening to what this pastor was sharing. Suddenly, I cannot remember what he said, but there was one word that came and hit me. And that made me look at it differently. I think he said the word, Feast of the Lord. That word jumped up and came before my eyes. Feast of the Lord. It's not Jewish feast. The scripture says, Feast of the Lord. Right? Have you read that in the Bible? It doesn't say Jewish feast. Right? It says feast of the Lord. Now that word, three words, jump up and hit me. And suddenly, there came a realization in me. It is the feast of the Lord given to one particular racial group. So that through them, the whole world can be taught things to come. That which is uh, Christ-centric and also a prophetic timeline. So that opened my eyes. Okay, it's no more Jewish feasts. So we don't uh, label them anymore. We call them the Feast of the Lord. All right. And uh, the subsequent year, the Lord called me to fast and pray during Rosh Hashanah in Jerusalem. So I, uh, in my life, I have learned one thing, you know. If the Lord calls you to do something, just obey. No questions asked. No questions, why, but, this, all that. You throw away all that. When the Almighty God can think that you are important enough to talk to you, then our small duty is to listen and obey the Almighty God. Amen? Amen. So this is my principle in my life that I practice. So I went to fast and pray in Jerusalem, and uh, it was some wonderful time with the Lord. I ne never saw anything special or different because usually during my uh, days of fasting and prayer, I have encounters with the Lord. And on this particular occasion, I'm having encounters with the Lord. So nothing special to tie it to a particular festival. And after Rosh Hashanah, it was Yom Kippur. So the Lord said, come again. Go to Jerusalem to fast and pray. Of course, you can fast anywhere, no? Right? When the Lord calls us to some particular place, again, you don't want to ask question. Just obey and go. Because the Master knows what he's talking about. Isn't it? Right? And the following year, this happened again. And the third year, it happened again until I began to join the dots together and I found something different on those occasions compared to my normal days of fasting and prayer. That's when I finally came to the conclusion, these are special times of the Lord, appointed times. That's what the Hebrew word says, you know, it's appointed time. Appointed time to meet with God on this special occasion. For us on this earth, because we are bounded by time and space, there are dates. But in the heavenly realm, they also gather there. I do not know exactly if uh, they go by our earthly January, February, March, you know. They don't count like that. They go by different count. But on that particular day, there is also a gathering in heaven where they all gather to honor the Lord, to celebrate and 
royal proclamations are made on those days. This I have come to realize after several years that this is something not just a, f a festival for a particular tribe or racial group, but it is the seasons and the times in heaven that God has taught his people just like there is a gathering in heaven, so let the people on earth gather on that same occasion. And as there's praise and worship that takes place in heaven, so let the people on earth praise and worship him. And just as announcements and pronouncements are made in heaven, those same messages will be delivered on the earth. So this being the foundation, so this year on Yom Kippur, so the Lord called me. Now, now the Lord didn't need to call me. No, it, it has become a pattern in my life. So on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur, I just designate them as days of fasting and seeking, waiting on the Lord. But I don't want to make a doctrine out of it and tell, tell anyone, this is my personal practice. So on the 28th of September, that was the day of Yom Kippur, the morning of Yom Kippur. So as usual, <coughs> at nine in the morning, I knelt down to pray. And as I knelt down, my spiritual eyes were opened. And I saw, I looked into heaven, or oh, I saw a, a group of angels and saints of God they were going somewhere. So I was wondering, where is everyone going to? And they all like seem in a hurry to go. And as I was looking, one among the many angels turned and looked at me, and he said, come and join us. So I asked them, where are you all going? He said, come quickly, which means, don't ask questions, just come, just come. So the next moment I was translated and I joined the angels and they said, come, let's go quickly. And we came to the throne room, not the throne room, but uh, another place where all the people in heaven gather before the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was like a large uh, square like a meeting area, and there was a huge group, mostly saints in heaven, angels of God, and there were some uh, people from the earth who were invited there. So when I reached there, so let's suppose, to just give you an idea, let's suppose the size of the gathering hall is about the size of this church. So, I came and stood right at the back. You know, they all are saints, and I'm just a commoner. Isn't it? Yeah. Right, yeah, I'm a commoner, you know? So I always feel a little bit uh, shy, and a little bit, um, I don't even say a little bit too much, uh, unqualified to stand in that holy gathering. So I stood right at the back, and uh, one a great saint from the Bible days, he turned and he looked. He said, where is, he called me by my first name. He said, where, where is he? So someone pointed out, there he's right at the back. He said, bring him to the front. So I was brought to the front and I saw Neville Johnson standing there. So he, he stood there. I have seen him many times, you know, in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly places. And he stood there in the front, and as soon as he saw me, he sadhu, you know, like he normally does. That has not changed. That's, that style and his mannerism of calling me, so sadhu, come, 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 come and stand here. So I stood be between Noel Johnson and the other biblical saint. And so I asked the uh, biblical saint, who was like a special watcher over my life, why are we here? So he told me, today 
the Lord is going to make a very important announcement. That is why we all are gathered here. And that is the reason why you have been brought here. Because your job is going to bring this message to the world. So that's why you are here. So, then the Lord began to speak. First he spoke generally. And then he looked specifically at me and he said, now this is what you must bring to the nations. And saying that, he said, before you give the word, you must show them one thing. And place it on the pulpit and then you give this word. So that's what I'm going to do now. I've never done anything like this in my entire life. So this will be a fuss. All of you know what is this, right? Is this good sign or bad sign? Okay, now I deliver to you the word of the Lord, verbatim. I'm not going to add one word more. I'm not going to one word subtract. I'm going to read to you as how the Lord spoke to me. The nations are weighed in the balances and found wanting. That's the first word. You read this in Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. And this is the inscription that was written. So what happens here is, if you may remember this passage in the book of Daniel, King Belshazzar had threw a great party for his nobles, his wives and everybody. And as they were drinking from the holy vessels from the Jerusalem temple, the hand of the Lord appeared and began to write on the wall. You remember that incident? Okay, that is what is, uh, that's the passage I'm reading from. So the hand wrote four words. Okay, so now we'll continue from the scriptures. Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 to 28. And this is the inscription that was written. Many, many tekel upasin. And this is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Takel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So this is a passage of scripture that we find in the book of Daniel. And the word of the Lord that he first spoke is, the nations are weighed in the balance and they are found wanting, meaning lacking. They are lacking on one side is the righteous standard of God. On the other side is the standards that are practiced in the nation. The heart and the soul of the nation, how does it stand? So they are put on one side and God's holy standard on one side and then to see which goes higher, which goes lesser or they stay balanced, equal. So the standards of the nations are equal to the standards of God. And the Lord Jesus continued to say, my father's hour of judgment is coming. Who will bear? It will be fire and brimstone. Now the word fire and brimstone was first mentioned in Genesis chapter 19 verse 24 where we read that God rained down fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And many theologians and many people, even Christians, 
used to discount that aspect of the incident in the Bible saying it's just a fairy tale or like Sodom and Gomorrah did not really exist. You know, it's just a figmentation of a man's imagination. If that was so, we read in Luke chapter 17, verse 29, that the Lord Jesus Christ quotes the very incident that took place in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, just like it rains fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be like in the last days. And to prove that Sodom and Gomorrah really existed, you know the word, another word for homosexuals is sodomy, right? It is still used today, sodomy. So where did that word sodomy come from? Sodom and Gomorrah. So that again proves the biblical incident is true. And again we read in Psalms chapter 11 verse 6, Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. That's witness number 2. And witness number 3, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 10. Those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark of the beast shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 10. So now we have three scriptural proofs that the raining down of fire and brimstone is real. It's real. So how can fire and brimstone come all the way from heaven, wherever heaven is? Third heaven, above the skies, how can they come down and kill someone? We can ask this question like that, you know. Have you heard of meteor showers? They are destructive, right? Yes. And when a meteor comes, it doesn't come just like a broken up planetary rocks. It carries fire. And when it falls down, it brings great destruction. Fire, brimstone. And um, history tells us, have you heard of this city called Pompeii? Yes. Now, history tells us the whole city of Pompeii was destroyed by fire and brimstone. And where did the fire and brimstone come from? A volcano. A volcano exploded with such a force that debris, rocks, fire, sulfur shot up five miles in the sky and then it dropped down. So, when it comes dropping down to a commoner standing on the ground, what will it look like? Fire coming from heaven. Right? Yeah. See? If you look at all the judgments ever recorded in the Holy Scriptures, God has used nature. He has used nature to go and execute His vengeance and His judgments. Because such things don't originate in heaven. Heaven is a beautiful, wonderful place. So, the hell and the lake of fire are created not for the people of God. It's for the devil and the wicked one. So, such things don't exist in heaven. They exist in a different realm. So, when the Lord spoke this, all the saints that were gathered there, they lifted up their voice at the same time and they said, O oh Lord, your judgments are right. The nations are turned against you and your laws. They have devised wicked ways against your kingdom and your children. Their thoughts are wicked. You know, recently, I conducted an online study on the book of Revelation. And um, all my life I've read the book of Revelation many times. 
But during this study, when I had to do a verse by verse exposition, then I cannot just take one passage here, another passage there to teach on or preach on. So during this detailed verse by verse study, I was amazed at the many times how absolutely righteous God's judgments are. And you'll read in the book of Revelation that the 24 elders and the four living creatures will quite often prostrate and fall down on their faces and say similarly, Oh Lord God, righteous are your judgments. Which means God cannot be faulted for whatever judgments he releases on the earth. For the people on the earth truly deserve the judgments that are given to them. That is the reason why before God pronounces judgments upon the earth, he first reads out the sins of the nations. They are all laid out before all the angels, before all the saints in heaven, before all the creatures, the sons of God in heaven. They are all told what is happening on the earth. See, on a technical side, when a person dies and then they go to heaven, every memory of earth is erased from their minds. So it doesn't stay there. You know, I'm sure you have heard of the sea of glass, right? It is not really glass. It is a sea, like a, like a large swimming pool. So let's suppose, I'll just demonstrate like this, okay? Now let's suppose the center section here is where the sea of glass is. And this is where a person enters. In. Let's suppose a soul. After that, they enter into heaven. Let's say they come through that doorway. I can tell you for in exact detail because I once saw my own associate when he died, how he was received into heaven. So they enter into heaven. And then before they can proceed anywhere, even coming before the Lord Jesus, the Lord sits on his throne and the books are open to judge a person. Whether this person qualifies to enter into the inner places of heaven. So, when the Lord told his angel, let the books be opened. And I saw my associate standing there, no? And the face of the Lord, there was no smile. He was so serene. You don't even know what's going to happen next. You know, expressions expressionless you wouldn't know whether he's going to say get lost to hell or well done good and faithful servant you don't know even I was standing there and was wondering what's going to happen next so when the books were opened there were many books so this huge angel who stood by the right side of the Lord he just opened many books and he was looking here looking there and till then there was solemn silence in the whole of all who were gathered there. And after some time, this angel turned and looked at the Lord. And without saying anything, they were just communicating through thoughts. Only after that, a big smile came on the face of the Lord Jesus. And he looked at my associate and said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your father. After the Lord said that, several angels and some saints came running, you know. They said, oh brother, welcome, welcome, welcome. Just like how you would greet a newcomer, no? So remember this. Next time, when a, when a visitor comes, don't maintain social distance. <laughs> Just give them a big bear hug. All right? Because you are in the presence of the Lord. Your presence kills every germs. Amen. You believe that? Yes. Okay. So, they, you know, they put a garland like in true Indian fashion. 
They put a garland of flowers on his neck. They shook their hands. They hugged him. She come, let's go. He was brought before to the place that is assigned for him to be in his dwelling place. So after this, every soul, now till that moment, you still carry memories of the earth. You remember everything that went on in your life on the earth. You remember your family, you remember everything. Then, see, till then, you will still cry. You will think about the past. You will think about your failures. You will think about, oh, if only I had more opportunity. I could have done this, I could have done that. Because those things will be told you. This is your ultimate destiny, but this is what you have done. See? That's why the scripture says, even in heaven, they will weep. So you don't want to regret, right? You still have time here. So every waking day, seek the will of the Lord for your life. So that when you leave this world and you go to heaven, you are complete. You are complete in Him. No regrets anymore. Full of joy. So there will be all these regrets and the, this wondering, will my loved one make it? Will my husband make it? Will my wife make it? Will my children make it? All those anxieties will be there because you see all these wonderful things in heaven. Okay, so therefore, they are brought through this river of life. When they wait through the river of life from one end, and they come out the other end. Once they come out the other end, every memory of the earth is gone. Every bad memory, every wounded emotions, all erase. All erase. So once they are erased, there's only one thing in your heart, full of joy to praise and worship the Lord God. Okay? So no memories about the earth. Is it good news or bad news? Yes. Good news. <laughs> but, you see, you forgot one thing, you know. When the memories are erased, memories of your family are also gone. Good news or bad news? Okay, now no voice at all. <laughs> Everything is gone. So you don't even know what is happening on the earth. However, <clears throat> by the power of the Lord, sometimes He will bring back the memories and give it to you. Then you will suddenly remember. But if another person goes to heaven, like say for a visit, then the, the memory of that person will be given by the Lord Jesus. And they'll remember. And the first question they'll ask is, how is everything on the earth? What's going on now? And more so, they are, they are concerned about the state of affairs of the church. What's going on? What's going on? But it's not like how we are we ask questions in a busy body manner. Not in that. It's just inquisitive. To measure that against the laws of God. The commandments of God. So, this is the standard there. And that being the case, the Lord tells them what are the things that are taking place on the earth and therefore, this is the judgment I am going to pronounce. And they all get to see something very powerful, you know. How extremely long-suffering and patient God has been. If you can honestly look back at your own life, from the day that you were born again, till now, maybe 20 years or 30 years, If in one split second you can just recall back, you will agree with me that you don't deserve the grace of God at all. 
Amen. Amen. Right? For the, the manner of life we are living, when we know we should be here, but we are still here. Amen, everybody? And yet, God has not given to us what we rightfully deserve. Right? Why? Because of His great love. Great love. That is why all the saints in heaven and the angels will rejoice and say, Oh Lord, you are so righteous. All your ways are perfect. And you've been so patient. Patient. You know, from that time earth started, 6,000 years, we know that the devil is making a mess. Right? But before earth started, his sin first started in heaven. Now that is how long? We don't know, right? It's so it's timeless pass. Timeless pass. Let's let's just suppose a uh, one thousand years ago. So one thousand years of uh, this Lucifer becomes Satan sin, and then another six thousand years. So altogether, about seven thousand years. The Lord God has been patiently putting up with the devil. Does he need to? No. He didn't need to. He could have just wiped the devil off when sin first took root in his mind. Isn't it? But he didn't do that. You know why? Because there is a divine law that a sin must reach its fullness. It's a divine law. So God waited patiently for it to reach its fullness. And then he meets his judgment. And during that season of its reaching its fullness, all beings in heaven get to see the righteousness of God. How he deals with that matter. Not out of anger. Not out of frustration. Not out of retaliation, but how he acts in love. So when he ultimately executes his judgments, it is because the sin has reached its fullness and is going to give birth to. So it's at that time God executes his judgment. So all the saints cry, Oh Lord, your judgments are right. The nations are turned against you and your laws. They have devised wicked ways against your kingdom and your children. Their thoughts are wicked. So after saying this, then the Lord spoke this. Now this is about the United States of America. So from now onwards, what I am, whatever I'm going to share with you is all centered on the United States of America. America will be judged. That's why this weighing scale is here. And I'm sure you have heard this over and over and over and so much so, most Christians just couldn't care less about the word America will be judged. Am I right? Am I right? Let's be honest. Am I right? You see, you have, you have heard this over and over. Even I myself have stood here and in several other conferences in the US and have said the same thing. But if God had judged when he first spoke those words, where would we be today? We would have been gone to hell, you know? Right? You wouldn't be sitting here and enjoying the grace of God. If he had executed his judgment there and then, when the word was first spoken over this nation, where would we be? So again, he extends his grace. He extends his grace. One more year, Lord. One more year. One more year. The Lord Jesus Christ goes and stands before the Father God and he prays, one more year, 
one more year, one more year. It's because of his prayers, the judgment is postponed, postponed, and postponed. But there will come a time where it cannot be postponed anymore, right? There will always come a time. And now is that crucial time. That is why at such a time as this, the Lord specifically told me, now you go and bring this message. So America will be judged. How will she be judged? Two ways. A flood is determined for her. It will devastate the Mideast. A fire is appointed for her. It will devastate the Midwest. So to the east is a flood, to the west is fire. I don't exactly know why, but I'm just saying to you what the Lord told me. A flood is determined for her. It will devastate the Mideast. And a fire is appointed for her. It will devastate the Midwest. Then the Lord Jesus looked at me and he said, Now I want you to go to America and warn them of the judgment that is coming upon them. Now please listen very carefully. If they choose the wrong president. You know, this is the second time in my entire ministry in the U.S. from 1991 till now, where the Lord specifically spoke to me concerning the destiny of the United States in relationship to choosing the right president. I've never heard from the Lord in the previous years like that. So. He said, go and warn them of the judgment that will come upon them if they choose the wrong president. He, now referring to Mr. Trump, should continue for another term for God's purposes to be done for this nation. Which means God is extending his grace towards the United States of America for one more time, one more time. You know, sometimes you cannot see what is taking place behind the scene. We look at a person's external acts and then we want to hurl stones at him, throw all kinds of brick bats. This is a good for nothing president. This is not nonsense president. During a recent online study that we were doing, I felt a stirring one day and I made an appeal to all the students who were on our class. I said, I call for a 21 day Daniel fast for the US elections, which should have begun from the 12th of October. And 21 days will last right up to a day before the US election, November 2. It will last that long. So I, I said, I feel a great stirring in my spirit. This nation is at a crossroad. And you should not vote for the wrong guy. So a wrong guy should not come to office. If a wrong guy comes to office, then this nation is doomed. You're doomed for good. No more salvation. So I felt a great stirring in my spirit. And I made this announcement. After I made this announcement, I think a day or two later, one of the student, he blasted me. He wrote me a mail and he blasted me. He said, what, what in the world do you know about all the mess that Mr. Trump is doing. How can you support this man? How can you, you know, he went on rattling. You know, he has taken away these, these, that, all that. And then he finally ended up by saying, we don't need any foreigner to come and tell us how to vote. 
Okay, that last sentence, I looked at it, I read, I read it again and again. I tried to look at his heart, in what attitude he was writing, you know. The point he was making was more about his personal social benefits that he can gain from the system. So, translate into normal language would be bread and butter. You don't just look at bread and butter. You must look at the destiny of the nation. Not just bread and butter. You know, when you are in the right standing with God, the next four years can be, you may see a different Mr. Trump than what is the first four years were. And I tell you one truth, I've never seen any president of any nation so badly insulted, so badly trash like Mr. Trump of the US. No other nations have ever done that to their presidents or to their prime ministers, you know. The utter disrespect that the general American people have for their head of state. That is very, very contemptuous. You can't respect, you can't honor, whether you like or you don't like. That's not the issue, no. It's not the man, you know, it's the office. It's the office that you pay respect to. If not this man, another man will come. It's not the man, it's the office. So whoever sits in that chair deserves to be respected, deserves to be honored. You agree? Yes. I feel very, very saddened, you know, when I, when I read in the media how much they're bashing him left and right. See, I cannot cite anything. I don't want to make any personal comment. That's not my place. So I will just stick to now, I'm not here to answer the brother's letter. I'm not here to tell you how to vote. I'm here to tell you what God thinks. Amen. That's my job. Amen. To reveal to you the mind of the Lord. Yes. To reveal to you the will of the Lord. That's my job. Then you decide. In 1992, or, yeah, 1992, when I came to the U.S. a second time, or maybe it's 91, I was interviewed by a Christian TV station in Chicago. So at the end of the interview, the person who was interviewing me asked me a question. So this is your first visit to our country. What do you think about our country? I looked at him and I said, my opinions don't matter. But let me tell you how God sees America. And I gave him the word of the Lord, how God sees America. See, my personal opinion doesn't matter, you know. I may like today, I may not like tomorrow. So a man's opinions can, cannot be trusted. They cannot be trusted. When I first came to America, you know, every day, Americans like to use the word, oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. In the East, the word love is a very strong word. When we say, I love you, it means I will die for you. So when I saw all this, oh, I thought, oh my God, these people are willing to die for me. Why? Why do they love me so much? So these thoughts were going on in my mind now. Oh my God, look at these Americans. What great love. I love you. I love you. Then I saw them calling their dog, oh, doggy, I love you. <laughs> Okay, then I began to weigh, put on the scale. They love me and they love the dog. So am I the, equal to the dog? Then I, it began to make me wonder the concept of love that you use. And then I found, actually what you really mean is, I like you. When you say, I love you, you mean, I like you. See? So I like you today, I don't like you tomorrow. 
So I love you today, I don't love you tomorrow. This is human heart. Amen? Human heart that fluctuates to the, like a seesaw. But God's opinions does not change. It is more important to know what God thinks than what a person thinks. So, he, Mr. Trump should continue for another term for God's purposes to be done for this nation. Which means they are not finished yet. God wants to give you another four years of grace. Four years to restart something. Restart. It's a restart. So this first four years was just following the ground. Following the ground. So the next four years will be for the seeds to germinate. For the shoots to come. And for flowers to come. And for fruits to come. And the tree to blossom and grow. And you will be once more. Be a respected nation. A nation that's looked up presently. I'm, I'm sad to say this. I'm sorry to say this. No nation in the world respects America. The high reputation that America once had is at all time low. It's not because of Mr. Trump. Not because of him. It's a system that is accumulated like dust, you know. Dust gathers dust accumulated to what where we are today. But the purposes of God for this nation is not over yet. And on the so the first part of the word I received on Yom Kippur. Then on the 5th of October, as I was studying the book of Daniel in chapter 11, suddenly I saw a vision. And the Lord began to speak to me about the United States again. And he said, three powerful prince angels are stationed with President Trump. Just like the angels stood with King Darius to strengthen him. You read that in Daniel chapter 11 verse 1. This angel who stood with King Darius. Now King Darius is not a Christian. He's not even a Jew. He's a Gentile. A Persian king. But God's prince angel was appointed to stand with him. To guard him and protect him. In the similar manner, three, eight, three powerful prince angels are stationed with President Trump. And they will strengthen him and he will triumph. Amen. So what exactly that word triumph means, I don't know. It can mean he will be re-elected. It can also mean he will overcome all the big bats that were thrown at him. He will triumph. So I don't want to add in my own opinion or commentary there. And the Lord Jesus said this, I love him. He is my servant. And when the Lord Jesus spoke that, I saw tears coming down his eyes. He said, I love him. He is my servant. He will fulfill my will for this nation as well as for Israel. If the Christians in this country will gather together in groups, in churches, to pray sincerely without prejudice and bias, then I will push back the enemy's plans to thwart Trump. Right now, all hell has been released against Mr. Trump. That is why even the good media who are supporting him suddenly turn violent. Suddenly have turned against him. It is all the work of the enemy. 
how can they suddenly change nobody suddenly changes you know it's the work of the enemy so what does this tell us prayers for the president has gone way down way down if you all don't mind may i frankly tell you my personal opinion about american christians okay you won't get offended no you will still love me yes you love me or you like me <laughs> tell me you love me or you like me are you sure yes you will die for me American Christians don't really care. They don't really care for another. Now, I don't mean each and every American, no. Generally, okay, generally, they don't care. Why? They are self-centered. Very self-centered. So this is general. Now, when you look at the Christians, they are no better either. How much? Now, you tell me honestly, okay? How many of you sincerely pray, stand in the gap, and pray for your great nation? See, not every hand is going up here. not every hand is going up so i am right in what i said you just don't care okay now question number 2 how many of you sincerely battle in prayer for your president so just be honest you know you don't need to show me your numbers see again not all hands went up and there are more than 3000 people watching online we do not know how many today and i can see their hands going up but generally what the numbers that are reflected here will be the same numbers that are reflected there so why don't you do that because you don't care you don't care <coughs> you don't care whether mr trump gets bash See when you see all this happening have you raised up an army to stand in the gap do a 24/7 prayer watch let's surround surround the president with prayer make sure he is fully guarded how many how many we sincerely do that to just simply pray a normal prayer amounts to nothing to really intercede is different anybody can simply pray simple prayer is not enough for this kind of warfare that we are entering to like what the destiny of the nation is you need to enter into serious intercession seriously locking horns with the enemy then the warfare will stop then the enemy's plans to thwart the election or to rig the election will all be failed even you know do you know that even a large number of evangelical christians don't want to vote for mr trump anymore i am shock so they'll rather have a wrong man into the office than god's choice if you look at the history of the kings in the bible even those who are hand picked by god they were never perfect right they were never perfect but they were god's choice 
So you cannot expect a perfect person to be in the office when the citizens are not perfect. Right? When we are not perfect, how can you expect another man to be perfect? They'll be bound to be ups and downs. The most important issue is who is God's man? God calls Nebuchadnezzar, another heathen king. He's my servant. Cyrus, another heathen king. He was called by name in the Bible, you know. 500 years before he was born. I was amazed when I read the scriptures, you know. Maybe 100, 100 years before Cyrus was ever born. His name is written in the Bible. And God calls him, he is my servant who will do my will. And during the reign of King Cyrus, what is that one will of God that he, di he did? To release the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And then finance them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and to build the temple again. That's all he did. And that was his destiny. But what, how was his reign during his entire lifetime? Nebuchadnezzar, extremely proudful, arrogant king. But God calls him my servant, who will execute my will. So don't look at the externalities of a person and then throw brickbats and judge them. What's most important is, what is God's choice? Who is God's choice? Then cast your word to God's choice. I will show him my favor and shower my grace upon him. He is a broken man within him and fights for survival. This is how God sees him. You know, I, I bet none of us knows what Mr. Trump feels in his bedroom. Right? When he's all alone in his bedroom, how you will never know his heart. But God is seeing his heart. And he's saying, he's fighting for survival. Not even the next term, you know. Even to finish his term, he's fighting for his survival. He's a broken man. The very people who should support him, even if they turn against him, the evangelical Christians, if they turn against him, then you will lose all hope. Isn't it? It's like your own family turning against you. A father turning against his children, the children turning against the father, or the wife turning against the husband, and the husband turning against the wife. How can a family stand? Right? That is why, you know, if you look at so many pastors, why their marriages break? Of course, minus some infidelity, minus that those rare cases, most cases are a spiritual attack. Divide the house, the man falls. So it's a curse from the witches. It's a plan of the devil to break a minister's family. I tell you, a dear pastor friend that I knew, he was traveling from uh, Australia, coming back to in, uh, Singapore. So he sat on the plane, and there was another fine-looking uh, Caucasian man seated beside him. And uh, after they were seated, they exchanged pleasantry. And, and the man was silent throughout the entire journey. So it, it's an eight-hour journey from Sydney to Singapore. And during the meal times, this man politely tells the stewards, stewardess, I don't want to eat. So he never drank, he never ate. And this pastor was feasting. 
And then the pastor noticed this man was mumbling, his mouth, his lips were mumbling something. And so out of curiosity, so the pastor asked him, uh, excuse me sir, why aren't you eating? So the, this man said, I'm fasting. So you know, who uses the word fasting? Mostly Christians, right? So this pastor thought, oh, he must be a Christian. So he asked him, sir, are you a Christian? So this man said, no, I'm not a Christian. Oops. If you are not a Christian, who are you? And unabashedly, he said, I'm a priest from the satanic church. So as soon as this pastor heard satanic church, he moved a little bit <laughs> to the window. You know, he, could, he couldn't go anywhere else because there's only two seats, right? So he moved to the edge a little bit. And then he asked, so what are you fasting about then? Without any reservation, this satanic priest said, I'm fasting. Or the reason why the satanic, satanic priest was saying all that, because this pastor did not introduce himself as a pastor. And later on he told me he was so glad he didn't say who he was. And the satanic priest revealed his purpose of fasting, to break up minister's marriage. They have an assignment. And they fast and they pray so that a minister's family is broken up. Marriage is broken. So once it is broken, you, you already won the war. A broken man. They, they will not get up to where they are in the first place. They will not rise up, you know. So even if your marriage is broken, rise up and put the devil to shame. Amen. Don't sink under. Because the devil wants that to be accomplished. He wants you to sink under and be defeated. You don't sink under. You arise. Arise like the phoenix. The mythical phoenix. You arise from the ashes. And go on with greater power, greater strength. Amen. So I will show him my favor and shower my grace upon him. For he is a broken man within him and fights for survival all the nasty attacks against him show the sinful and evil nature of the majority of the people of this nation who want unrighteousness to triumph there is an evil plan by the LGBT community to vote Trump out and transform this nation into Sodom and Gomorrah. Their borders are not secure. The southern entry is where evil is brought into this nation. Even witchcraft, sorcery, and abominations of many kinds are brought into this country through that access. The enemy is fighting hard to prevent the wall of protection from coming up. You know, I have seen in multiple visions that groups and groups of witches and wizards chanting and putting curses upon Mr. Trump. They are chanting, they are concocting all these potions and they are putting curses upon him. And also, they are working doubly hard so that Judge Amy is not voted to become a Supreme Court Justice. It's all the plans of their enemy working terribly hard. And what do the Christians do? Sleep. Sleep. You don't care. 
when they who work for Satan can be so fervent, how should the church be? No, you are fighting with one another. Right? We are busy making videos and putting on YouTube, criticizing this church, this pastor against that pastor, against this, against that. What are we doing? Instead of using the sword to fight against the devil, we are using the sword to fight with one another. Is that the reason why the Holy Spirit gave you that sword? The sword of the Spirit is not to fight with each other. I am not your enemy. You are not my enemy. Right? The principalities, the powers, and the rulers of darkness, and the spiritual wickedness in the high places, they are our enemy. So we should war against them, not against one another. But look how successfully the enemy has caused us to be diverted. This is similar to the doctrine of Belayam. See, Belayam was hired by Balak to curse the children of Israel. So he tried and he was unsuccessful because God was for them. So then Belayam came up with a very clever plan. All right, we cannot curse them directly. But let's make God curse them himself. Very clever plan. The very protector becomes their judge. So how to do that? Just make them sin against one another. And then they become an offensive to God. This is the clever ploy. So how do we do that? King Balak asked him, very simple, sir. Send all the prettiest girls in your kingdom and the most handsomest men in your kingdom, send them to Israel. And let them entice the daughters and the sons of Israel. Not to marriage, but to commit sexual immorality. Once the nation has committed sexual immorality, then don't worry, Balak. You just rest in peace. God himself will destroy them. See? Make them kill one another. The plan of the enemy. And that's what is happening today. And this was what was warned in the book of the New Testament. Beware of the doctrine of Belayam. Beware. Because it creeps in. The error of Belayam, the doctrine of Belayam, and the ways of Belayam. Three things. It's all in the church. We are busy fighting with one another. So when you're so busy making videos and then posting on the YouTube, where do you have time to intercede? Right? You don't have time to intercede. You're busy making all those videos and criticizing one another. But even in the midst of all this, that is why God finds us absolutely untrustworthy. So one last chance now. You're still about what, three weeks from your election? So about three weeks from election. So I humbly and lovingly, lovingly ask you on behalf of the kingdom of God, the Lord God who sent me to you to stand in the gap, to fast and pray for your president. And Every Christian in America will make the right choice. They will not be swayed by popular opinion. They will not sway by all the propaganda that's come from the media. All those things that are against, they will not be fooled. But the angels of God will go forth and to lead and guide every American, especially evangelical Americans to make the right choice. So when the Lord spoke about the borders, I saw in a vision mighty angels of God standing on the U.S. side 
and across the border i saw evil mighty fallen angels and they were standing on the other side and the fallen angels they looked at this angels of god and they were hurling insults threats and vulgarities they were just throwing at them now is a message for the churches the churches that do not seek me them i will judge they have allowed so much of corruption to come inside them they must be cleansed and sanctified let the righteous ones arise and put their houses in order let them seek me to know my ways and my plans for them my eyes are upon them let them surrender their ways to me and seek me i will teach them and guide them they shall not fail but succeed in conclusion the lord said this behold i am coming to visit this nation and before i close i want you, i want to read a scripture and i would like every one of you to please open your bibles to second kings chapter 17 and the verses 13 to 15 second kings chapter 17 verses 13 to 15 it says like this yet the lord testified against israel and against juda by all of his prophets every seer saying turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which i commanded your fathers and which i sent to you by my servants the prophets nevertheless they would not hear but stiffened their necks like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the lord their god and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he had made with their fathers and his testimonies which he had testified against them they followed idols became idolaters and went after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the lord had charged charged them that they should not be like them your forefathers when they founded this nation now i want to honestly tell you i've never read very deeply into american history whatever i'm share with you now is what the lord has showed me about this nation your forefathers starting from george washington they dedicated this land to the living god i have i have personally seen in a vision Mr George Washington kneeling down and crying with tears praying with tears unto the living god and his tears rolled down from his eyes and fell on the sand on the ground and i saw the hand of the lord come down from heaven scoop up the wet sand and take it up to heaven and place before him each time the lord wanted to judge america the tears in the sand cries out to god it the tears cry out lord remember remember spare this nation spare this nation and because of the covenant that your forefathers made with the lord the lord remembers the covenant he made with your forefathers 
you have had righteous presidents in this nation mr trump is the 45th president right so in the 45 presidents you have had if not all there were some at least i know four because i've seen these four presidents in heaven and they pray for the united states still today because they have been appointed to pray i recognize two of them the other two i could not recognize them but at least there are four righteous presidents in the united states in the history of us so far and their their prayers is what has stopped the hand of god from bringing judgment so now god has extended given this nation a period of grace you all knew what happened the first term by all count mrs hillary clinton should have won the election right she should have been your president she should have been but at the last moment there was a turn am i right everybody yes. at the last moment the balance tipped who tipped it god tipped it not the russians <laughs> ah not the russians is the finger of god the very finger that wrote the 10 commandments the very finger that appeared on in babylon to write many many tekel upasin that finger tipped tipped the balance in favor of mr trump why because of god's destiny for this nation and i want to tell you truthfully during this first term that which was assigned for him he has fulfilled as far as his part to restore israel back to its glory that first part he has done now there's another part he needs to do that is to bring this nation back to righteousness so that can be done in the next term only in the next term so this is where the americans must not be foolish to look at the wrong numbers to look at the wrong facts and then come to a wrong conclusion great things are at stake please turn your bibles with me to the book of daniel daniel chapter 10 In Daniel chapter 10 you read of an interesting incident here the prophet Daniel now it is very interesting because this particular incident happens during the time of king Cyrus in the third year of the reign of king Cyrus a thing was revealed unto Daniel and the thing was true but the appointed time was long he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision so in those days i daniel was mourning meaning fasting and praying for 3 full weeks 21 days so at the end of the 21 days and you'll read in verse 5 that an angel of god it is not gabriel which many bible teachers wrongly interpret it is not gabriel it's an angel belonging to the warrior class so be- belonging to the order of michael so he came and when he came and he brought a message to daniel and look at verse 12 then said he unto me fear not daniel for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your god your words were heard and i am come forth to give you words now pay attention to verse 13 but the prince of the kingdom of persia which stood me one and 20 days 
Now this is an angel of God, right? And he's a warrior class angel. From the first day that the prophet Daniel fasted and prayed, his prayer was heard and God dispatched the angel. He said, go. But as he was coming, he was stopped by a fallen angel of the devil kind. Who is the ruling angel over the airwaves or the airspace? And he prevented him from going down. You know, I was shown in a vision this whole scenario. So as this angel was coming, see warrior angels, they always carry a sword in their hands. So, we, because they're going to fight. But so when this angel passed through, let's say the gateway, passed through the gateway of Persia and then come into the land, he was stopped by this wicked prince and he asked him, where are you going? In a very rough, rough voice, no? So this God's angel never answered a word. He just kept quiet. Then this evil prince saw on the left side of the angel of God a scroll. So when he saw a scroll, he knew he is bringing a message for somebody. So that is why he withstood him to prevent that message from being given to whoever it was intended to. He didn't know who he's bringing the message, but he was stopping him. That is why he stopped him from bringing the message. So there's a war that takes place in the heavenlies. So right now, all the devils in the United States are fighting one man. Fighting one man. All the devils. The whole of even from Canada, Mexico, all the reinforcements call back. Let's fight this now. And the aim is to totally steal, kill and destroy not just one man, the whole of Christians in the US. You do not know what hell you are going to get into if the wrong man comes to the office. You do not know yet. I tell you, don't take your chances. Don't. We have gone through in our nation, when the wrong government is voted in, Christians' lives goes hell. You don't want that. There's still time to survive. There's still time. So please, I lovingly urge you, bend your knees. Have a regulated, coordinated fasting and praying.
Is being colors fast, bring to some love. 